we are finishing up our series, taking a look at different characters. We're taking a look, uh, sort of a deeper dive in the scripture as we look at different people in the scripture, what God has done in their lives. And we're asking ourselves the question, how do we become better disciples? How do we grow in our discipleship? What steps can we take? What practices and things can we put in place in our lives to, uh, to be closer to God and follow in the way of God? And, uh, and we're learning from these different characters. Uh, how, do we, how do we apply this to our life? So today we're going to take a look at um, Mary Magdalene, a name that you, you probably heard a lot, but maybe you haven't stopped to really hear her story. And I'm excited uh, to do that as we finish out this series. It's been, uh, it's been kind of an interesting week around here. We have, uh, our, we're part of a denomination called the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. That's a group of churches doing great things around this country and around the world. And that group of churches had its national convention in Memphis this past week. And uh, uh, so it was here in town, but it wasn't hosted by us, which is beautiful because we could just show up and go to things, but not have to do any extra work. So it was uh, really nice. And, uh, but we did host the missionaries from the, uh, around the world for, from our denomination on Tuesday. And just to get to hear these families and sit down with them, some of them who we support, some of them are supported by other churches in, in the Denom, but to hear what they're doing and hear the way that they're willing to, uh, to share the gospel around the world, to go to places I, I wouldn't even imagine taking my family even for a minute, and they have moved their whole families here because they sense the call of God to God's people, all of God's people matters. And so I've been blown away by that. Uh, it's been great to be able to, um, to recognize that we're part, uh, we link arms with so many other churches that are on mission and doing incredible things and to hear from other pastors and elders. And so, um, so my heart is full and feel blessed uh, from uh, a week of recognizing that we're not in this alone as a church. And it's just a, just a really cool thing. I want to pray for us and we're going to jump into the scripture together. Let's pray. God, thank you for... Uh, for your word. This is your living, breathing word that was written thousands of years ago, but God, it still speaks so clearly. And we pray today that it would speak really clearly to us. It would, it would grab us, that we would hear it with our ears, but also with our minds. And Father, that you would, you would grab hold of our hearts and send us out from here as people who live these words out. We pray this. In your holy name, amen. Well, Mary Magdalene was a follower of Jesus. We, we know her because she's mentioned so many times in the scripture. She's actually mentioned 12 different times in the scripture. That, that's more than most of the disciples were mentioned. And so the question is, what do you know about her? She was around Jesus some. We know her mostly from resurrection stories because she was around at the time of the resurrection. So she kind of pops up there. And I want us to walk through and just look really carefully at her life. She's introduced to us in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bible with you, you can pull out your phone and pull it up. It'll come up on the screens as well. Uh, she's introduced, and, and she comes up in many different places. We're gonna, she comes up in, in all the different Gospels, but we're going to look at her in Luke. And in Luke chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 1. It says this about Mary Magdalene. After this... Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene. Now stop right there. there Mary was by far the most common name, like a hundred times over the most popular name that we have today today. Everyone was named Mary, so they would marry of this, and she was Mary of Magdala. That's the town that she came from. That's why they're identifying her, uh, her in that way. You can easily get confused with several different Marys in Scripture. Mary of Bethany, Mary the mother of Jesus. So this is Mary Magdalene. Uh, <clears throat> Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons came out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So there's this little group of people following Jesus. You've got the 12 disciples, but there's also uh, these women that are with them. They're actually helping to, uh, to fund the mission, 
and, uh, and, and they're, they're hanging out with Jesus. They're spending time together. They're on mission together with Jesus as they begin to spread good news in the community around them. What I think is really interesting, we hear about Mary, and you hear where she's from, so it distinguishes who she is, but then there was sort of her little tagline, Mary, from whom seven demons were cast out. How would you like that for a nickname? Like, is that good? I don't, that's not what I, you know, uh, meet Kaz. He used to have warts on his toes. This is Kaz who used to have warts. Uh, or, or, I mean, I don't want to be named for the, the brokenness in my life. I don't want to be known for those things which were a mess. But Mary is introduced to us right off the bat. This is Mary from whom seven demons were cast out. Now, it could have been an actual seven different demons. It could have been uh, a specific number. But most often in Scripture, when you see certain numbers, numbers like 40, numbers like 10, numbers like 3, they're, they're communicating a little bit more than that. The number seven communicates in Scripture, when you see it, that's communicating completeness. This is Mary who had, who was, uh, had demons in her. And this is Mary who was completely healed. Right? This is Mary who has brokenness, but who's completely healed. I, I, when I think about this, I go, you know, there's some shame involved in this. She's, she's known by what was wrong with her. And that's a little bit of shame to that. I, I think back when I was uh, a kid, I was about 13, 14 years old, and my dad was letting me learn to drive just a little bit, just, just slightly, not, not a lot, and you know, maybe park the car or something. But we went to visit my grandfather's house. A bunch of family was in town, and my dad threw me the keys. He said, I left my car parked on the street. You need to pull it up next to grandpa's garage and park it right next to grandpa's garage. And he didn't come out with me to do it. He just threw me the keys. So I went out. I was super careful, man. I knew what I was doing. I started the car up. I'd done this before. I pulled it up carefully around, right up to the side of the garage. I was being so careful. I coasted. You know, I didn't want to, you know, we didn't need any speed here. I was coasting. And then I just simply hit the brake, except it wasn't the brake. There was a different pedal. Uh, it was very close. It was right, right next to the brake. But it, and I drove into my grandfather, like literally into the garage through the side wall of the garage. Of, uh, sorry. Now, yeah, 13, 14 years old, what do you do at this point? Uh, you, you back it out just a little bit, put it in park, and go inside, right? I mean, that's, that's what I did. I, 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 I went in. The whole family is gathered. You know, they're all hanging out. I, I come in, and I, say, I look at them all, and I say, I'm not feeling very well. I'm going to go. I gotta go lie down. I went to the room that I was staying in. You know, I, was like, I went and hid. I, oh, my stomach feels terrible. You know, I'm, I'm very sick. Uh, there was shame, and what do I want to do when there's shame? I want to hide. I went and hid. I went and hid so long. Finally, somebody came down. Eventually, this was found out. You recognize because I, I actually drove through the garage wall, so uh, it was it was found out. And I and my grandfather. Just so much grace, and he he just fixed it. He, it. It took a while, but he fixed it, and I got you know I got to be part of helping with that. But but I but when you when you sense that shame, you hide. We do this sometimes in big ways, but we do it even in small ways every day. It makes it really difficult to 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 think about someone like Mary because if I was Mary Magdalene, I'd want to be deuced, introduced as, you know, this is Mary Magdalene, stellar follower of Jesus. Not this is Mary Magdalene from whom seven demons were cast out. I can imagine the, the, the desire that she would have to just hide, to just disappear, but she doesn't. One of the most amazing things we're going to learn about Mary Magdalene is that she does not hide. That, that, that she was able to be introduced this way because she was part of this little community, this little community of faith that was so genuine, so honest, so full of grace that you could be known for who you really are, that you could be known with the real brokenness that's inside of you. You could be known, Kaz, who used to have warts on his toes or, or, uh, you know, or, or whatever the thing is. Right? You can be known for the real you and still be loved, and still experience grace. 
One of, the, one of the great ministries that uh, we have at our church is, is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and Al-Anon, and we, we, just, we have some fantastic ministries like that. You know, they're built on this, this premise where within that community, you get to be part of this little community, and, and, and many of you know this, it's sort of famously, you, you start the meeting by introducing yourself. You know, hi, I'm Kaz, and I'm an alcoholic. That seems so scary. But the thing is, to be fully loved you got to be fully known. And what Christ offers us in the gospel, and the reason that people like Mary were willing to follow Jesus around was because she didn't have to hide. She could be Mary who was broken. But remember, it was seven demons. That communicates something. She wasn't just broken. She was also fully healed. She was a person that had experienced healing I was with a, a, a group of pastors as I, uh, all week at this conference, and we were just talking about some of the ups and downs of ministry. And as we were sharing, we started trading pastor stories, and only pastors laugh at pastor stories, so I won't, I won't give you any. But, but, uh, but, they, but there were, you know, there's some ups and there's some downs in ministry. There's some good stuff and there's some broken stuff. And as we got to talking, we started talking about some of the just tough things that we experienced as pastors. I was with one friend that I hadn't seen since seminary. That was 20, none of your business ago. I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, it, long ago. And, and, uh, and, and I hadn't seen it since then. We started talking about this. Um, we started talking about the scars that, that we have from some of the things that we've gone through. You know what's amazing about that? Is the scars are they're healed. And when I look at the scars, I don't just see the pain of the experience. But I see the healing of a God who walked with me through it. I I see the healing of a God who takes broken people with broken things, with scar. A God who redeems us and heals us. And so those scars point to something so much deeper. It's a deep joy, a sense of beauty, beauty that's gone through real pain. And that to me is an amazing thing. When I meet Mary, from whom seven demons have been cast out. I meet someone who's able to point to the scars because the scars point to the healing. This is who Mary is. We learn uh, a little bit more about her. If we could, I'd love to walk through every time she shows up, but it's way too many times. So we're going to have to skip to the other end. We, we start at the beginning where we met her. But we're going to skip to the other end where, uh, where we begin to read about her in the resurrection story. So I want us to turn to John. We're going to flip over to John chapter 20. This is actually the passage that we talked about on Easter this year here. But we're going to go back and revisit it because I want us to look through this lens of Mary and what's going on with her. This is John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. It says this, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and they saw that the stone had been uh, removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said, "They they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put them. Now, we're, we're going to pick this back up, so just hang on right there. But I want, you to, I want you to get something. Mary Magdalene is not famous because of some incredibly creative thing that she said. She's not famous for some unbelievable act that she's performed. We don't see Mary Magdalene uh, performing some healing or, or doing something outstanding. We don't, even, we don't hear her giving us great sermon. We, that's, not why, that's not why we know Mary Magdalene. The reason we know Mary Magdalene 2,000 years later, the reason we tell Mary Magdalene's story is because she was there. What Mary Magdalene was good at was showing up. We, we see her name so many times through the scripture because she was constantly with Jesus. She kept showing up. The reason I love this first part of the story of the empty tomb is because early on the morning of the, you know, the first day of the week, guess who's there? 
They, they had seen Jesus go up on the cross and seen him die. Mary was standing there for that. She was there with some other Marys. In fact, she saw him go on the cross, and then she saw them put him in the grave. She knew he died, and they put him in the grave, and she saw that. She knew where it was. But when it comes to the early Sunday morning, who is at the grave? It's Mary. See, Mary is good at showing up. You know that, that stat that says uh, you know, 80% of success is showing up? You guys know that one? It's, it's totally made up. There's no, there's no uh, factual, you know, anything behind it. But I, I still believe in it. There, there, there's actually so much, so much truth in that. You got to show up. Now, I, I, with my kids, I've got, a, I've got a dad speech that I prepare about, the, you know, the showing up speech, right? I, because, you know, there's practices and kids get tired and cranky and don't want to go to practice. And I got, I got my little dad speech in my pocket. It's ready to go. Because I have four kids, I've just perfected over the years. And uh, I just keep, keep bringing it back out. But it, a kid says to me, Dad, I don't, I don't I, uh, you know, so I'm like, hey, let's, let's go to practice. It's practice time. Dad, I don't feel good. Oh, sure, you don't feel good, right? You know, nobody feels good when it's practice time and it's 95 degrees outside. I mean, uh, we're still going to practice. No, no, Dad, Dad, I'm really sick. You're sick because you stayed up uh, way too late last night, but we're still going to practice. Dad, I'm, I'm really sick. I don't need to go to practice. And that's when the speech kicks in. But, you know, showing up is 80% of success. Back in my day, that, you got to go there, right? Back in my day, when we were sick, we still showed up at practice. We would just take a knee and throw up on the practice field and go right back into the practice. That's how we did it in my day. Now, that speech hasn't worked yet, but I got four kids, and it's, it might. I just could keep, I'm going to keep trying it. Showing up matters. That, that's, actually, that's actually how we do relationships. And when we talk about a, a God who is relational, and we go, well, I, I would love to have a better relationship with God, we've got to talk about showing up. Do you know the story of Scripture is a story of God showing up for us? From the first page in this book all the way to the back, God just keeps pursuing us. He keeps pursuing us. He keeps showing up. He keeps calling his people to him. Often we run and turn the wrong direction. He keeps showing up all the way through history because he gets relationships. Now, when I went to college, um, some of you majored in really good things in college. You, you, you did math, science, you did biology, stuff that's difficult and hard. I majored in communications. And uh, I got to take up, one of my classes I took was on how to make friends. That was a real, that was class, friendship. You should have, you should have gone with me to college. There's not a lot of career opportunity out of that, but, uh, but, but the friend-making class, we got to do the friend-making class. You know what we learned in the friend-making class? The number one reason that you would have a relationship with someone, it's proximity, right? Being nearby. That's the number one thing. It's not even that you have things in common. It's not that you don't bicker and fight or argue. It's not that you see eye to eye. The number one, number one factor in relationships is proximity. It's being there. It's showing up. It's saying, I am here, I'm in, even if I don't get it, even if I don't have it right, even if things are bumpy, I'm here, I'm with you. Mary got that. She showed up over and over. She's mentioned 12 times in Scripture because she kept whatever Jesus was doing, she was there. How do we show up in our relationship with God? What does that look like? Showing up daily in, 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 uh, in, in time with the Father. Finding ways to read scripture every day. Find a way to spend time with, in prayer with God daily, over again. Put that in place in your life. It's also about showing up in the community. God's given us this community, this church, to be together, to point each other towards Christ, to gather for worship, lift our hearts and minds to him. This is an incredible church. You're good at this. We're good at this. Even, even during a pandemic when they said, you can't, you know, you know we don't want to be in the building. We don't want to be good neighbors. We're not going to be in the building. We figured out how to do it even online because we're a church that cares about showing up. Guys, 
This is the key to who Mary is. This is the key to why Mary had such an incredible, incredible passion. She's an incredible, passionate follower of God because, not because she's brilliant, but because she showed up. One of my favorite volunteers at church I uh, pastored uh, helped out with the technology. He was a technology volunteer. And uh, he's just an incredible volunteer for years and years and years. And uh, I love him. But he, he, he offended everyone. I mean, everybody. He was angry, grouchy. It was just a grouchy, angry sort of volunteer. He, uh, he would, he, there would always be some little deal like that, some little rub. Uh, when he, because he helped with technology, when we'd have someone new in, some guest or something like that, he was often the first one to greet them and help them get set up. And I, I would find myself saying, hey, uh, new you know, guest preacher that's going to come in, listen, you're going to meet this guy, and he's going to hurt your feelings. And I'm just, I'm sorry right now. He's he definitely going to, there's no even a maybe, he's definitely going to hurt your feelings. But I, I'm just sorry right now, but he's a good guy, you know. And, but you know what I love about him? He showed up. In fact, we would have hard conversations together sometimes because when you do journey in life together, you hit bumps, we'd have hard conversation, and I would always wonder, what's going to happen? How's this going to go? And we would not agree on something. We'd, we'd walk out of there not in full agreement. We didn't end with a hug, but on next Sunday morning, he showed up. He just kept coming. I learned so much from him about, about how to be a follower of Christ about how to be part of a church. You know, uh, that's a clue not just for being a church, but also for being a, a dad. And that's a clue for how to, how to be good in your workplace. You show up, and you keep showing up, even when it's broken, and even when there's mess, and even when it doesn't look the way you want it to look. You show up. Mary Magdalene, she showed up. Let's keep reading. I, I dropped this off in uh, verse 2. We're going to pick up in verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. Now, you got to remember, this is great because this is John that's writing this, and John, he just wants you to know he's faster. Okay. So he outran Peter, reaching the tomb first. Verse 5, he bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, the one who reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And then verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Did you catch that little interchange? The disciples looked, they saw, and then they went back. Who was still there? It's Mary. She's still standing there. She stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir... If you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. I love uh, this story. It's so credible. The disciples go away. Mary stays at the tomb. She shows up. She keeps showing up. She shows up with her authentic self, Mary, who demons have been cast out of. And she stays. Our, uh, our high schoolers, many of them are off on a trip this morning. Put some on buses the other day, 
and they took off up to the Boundary Waters. That's uh, at the top of Minnesota, between Minnesota and Canada, for seven days of canoeing and hiking. I packed one high schooler up in my family, or at least I saw him pack, and I didn't see any extra underwear or toothbrushes or anything like that. So when I was loading him on the van, I was like, I'm praying for you, Brother Greg, uh, this week. This be a uh, good week to be the youth pastor. Uh, it will be an incredible trip, and, uh, and God will change lives. It's just fantastic to do those kind of trips. They're themed for this week as, as they're up there. You, you'd be praying for them this week. Um, their theme this week as they're up there is stick to itiveness. That's a great biblical word. The, the biblical word is hupomeno. It's a Greek word. It means hang on, to hang under, to hang in. Mary, she had stick to itiveness. She was still there. Everybody else, even when the, it felt like the dreams had gone, when Jesus, they watched him get put into the grave, they just knew he was gone and dead. Mary stayed. She's her authentic self. She keeps showing up, and she stays. That's what's great about being a family. When, when I, we talk about our church, we talk about our church as a family, and this really is. You know, the thing about families, you, you just keep coming back, even when there are bumps, even when things aren't perfect, even when you don't see the eye to eye, you keep showing up. You say, yeah, but, but we're family. We're going to go through this together. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. When I don't get it in my relationship with Christ, uh, my tendency is to run. When I sense shame and brokenness, my tendency is to hide. But that's not the call of Scripture. The call of Scripture is to follow Mary's example and keep showing up and stay there, even, even when it seems bumpy. And then there's one, one more piece to this. She's, uh, there's a lot of confusion going on. She doesn't even recognize Jesus when she sees him. It's resurrected Jesus right there. She doesn't recognize it. Tons of confusion. It's not until she hears him say her name. We, we talked about this uh, a bit at Easter, but we got to stop just for a second and understand that she recognizes his voice. And you know, that, that, that's an important part of being a follower of Christ, is to begin to recognize the voice of Jesus how do I know when I'm following God's call? What, what does it look like to, to follow God's call in my life? How do I hear the voice of Jesus? You know, you don't just wake up and do that. That actually takes practice. That takes putting practice in place in your life. Mary was with Jesus so much. She spent so much time with him. Of course, she would recognize his voice. She knew what his voice sounded like. You see, there's the flip side of this too, right? He knew her name. God knows your name. He knows your voice. He knows what's going on in your life. The skill for us, the, the development and character for us is to begin to learn to recognize God's voice in our lives. We do that by spending time with the Father. We do that by spending time in prayer, but also in Scripture. You know, we're given God's word in Scripture. And one way to understand, is this God's call in my life, is to say, does this sound like Scripture? Does it, does, it, does it jive with this lens on the world? Because if it doesn't sound like Scripture, it's probably not coming from God, right? That God gives us uh, his word in, in this Scripture so that we can understand when we're sensing calling, when, when we're wondering, hey, God, are you taking us this direction, that it would make sense, it would go along with Scripture. It agrees with Scripture. And so we need to uh, spend time with the Father to recognize his voice. We need to spend time in his word to say, does this sound like scripture? But the third thing is that we need to have others around us to help us discern God's call. So since the Presbytery was in town this week and uh, the, the, our whole denomination, it just reminded me that as Presbyterians, we do this in a certain way. Like as a pastor, I don't get to just say, I feel called to be a pastor. Uh, in a Presbyterian world, if you were to raise your hand and you go, I feel called to be a pastor, we would say, awesome. God is working in your life. We recognize that call in your life. But let's take us some time and discern it together. You actually get a little team of people around you that help you walk through a process. Presbyterians are very good at processes. They take a very long, uh, very careful processes. But, uh, but, but the idea behind it is a group of people around you to walk with you in this journey to say, is this really the calling of God in your life? And when it comes down to it, you get through the, 
the whole process, we gather. We even do this with our elders. You, you've seen this the last couple of weeks. We gather around, lay hands on. This is confirmation of this call. God has given you people around you to help you discern his call. You, you need prayer partners. You need people with you to be able to have a conversation and say, I, I'm sensing God calling me in this, in, in this way. Does that sound right to you? Would you pray with me about this? Would you help me do it? Mary was an incredible follower of Jesus, not because of something this fantastic that she did, not with something so spectacular. Well, well maybe it was fantastic and spectacular because what she did was show up, just who she is, honest and authentic, and she kept showing up, and she stayed, and she listened for the voice of God. May we be followers of Christ like Mary Magdalene. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this incredible story, for your word that speaks so clearly. God, would you, would you be, help us to be the kind of community where we can be known, fully known, and it point to grace? I think as a church, it's just so full of grace that we can be us. And Father, would you, would you help us to keep showing up? And then, God, would you speak clearly to us, each one of us? We pray all these things in your holy name.